Okay, so here's where we're going to kind of launch into the early and high classical periods. So the beginning of the classical period starts with a really important historical event to the Greeks. It was the Greeks' defeat of the invading Persian army. So the Persians had a very strong army. King Xerxes was strong, and he came to the Greek um, territories and tried to take them over, but um, Greeks came together as a society and drove them off. And after this intense battle with the Persians, the Greeks' identity became even stronger um, than before the war with the Persians. Persians. So um, from now on, after the Persian War, the Greeks really do become their own civilization distinct from Asia and Asia Minor. And even though they continue to interact with Asia, they're very separate, which is different than the archaic period or the orientalizing period um, or the earlier periods, geometric period that we looked at, um, which had a strong influence from Asia. But now um, the Greeks really are coming up with their own identity uh, during the early and high classical periods and onward from there. So. Um, so the decades following the defeat of the Persians is considered the high point of Greek civilization. And this is when Sophocles um, lived, when um, the statesman Pericles lived, when the philosopher um, Socrates was around, and many of um, ancient Greeks, you know, famous artists were around during this time. So we'll take a look at, oops, sorry, the Temple of Hera II or Apollo. Um, at Paestum, Italy, 460 BCE, and it's a Doric-style temple, and Olympia is the site of the Olympic Games, and the architect was Liban of Elis, and the Temple of Zeus was started around um, 470 BCE. So today the temple is in ruins, but we can look at a different temple, which is this one, um, to get a good idea of what the Temple of Zeus looked like at Olympia. And it looked like the temple shown here, the Temple of Hera II or Apollo in Paestum, Italy. So both temples, the Temple of Zeus in Olympia and the Temple of Hera II in Paestum, Italy, they both had six columns on the short ends and two columns in Antis in the interior. I think you can kind of see them there. And the Temple of Zeus, which is now in ruins, was more lavishly decorated than the temple shown here. Um, statues filled both of its pediments, and narrative reliefs adorned the metopes, so these little areas up in the frieze. And let's see. And they even decorated the interior metopes as well over the porch of Proneos, over the doorway. So, um, and there was a back porch or a pithodomos also that featured relief sculpture um, for the Temple of Zeus. So it's a little confusing because we're looking at the Temple of Hera and then we're talking about the Temple of Zeus, but um, they're very similar. So that's why we do that. Um, so this sculpture is on a metope. Um, from the Temple of Zeus in Olympia, Greece. And metopes are in the frieze, and only Doric order temples section out the frieze into metopes. And it's from the Temple of Zeus. And the metopes on the Temple of Zeus depicted the 12 labors of Heracles. And Heracles was the legendary founder of the Olympic Games. And this was located in Olympia, Greece, so that made sense that they featured Heracles. And um, he's considered one of the greatest Greek heroes. And in this metope, Heracles holds up the sky. And as you can see, Athena is helping him. She's behind him. And Heracles is doing this in place of Atlas, who would normally hold up the sky. But At Atlas has actually undertaken a dangerous journey to fetch the golden apples of the Hesperides for Heracles. So this is one of the 12 tasks Heracles had to perform in order to become a god. So this is just one of the 12 metopes. And eventually he does complete all of the tasks and he does join all of the gods on Mount Olympus. And as you can see, 
Atlas stand, stands in front of him with the golden apples, um, ready to hand them to Heracles. And all the figures have kind of a serenity to them. They have a severity that really contrasts with the previous archaic period, you know, where all the figures were smiling and looking at you. Um, these ones are much more serious. And a lot of art historians actually call this early classical phase of Greek art the severe style, um, just because of the severity of the, of the figures. Um, so here's a chariot race of Pelops and Omnio, Omniomas, I, I have a hard time sometimes saying his name, but um, from the East Pediment of the Temple of Zeus in Olympia, Greece, 470-456 BCE, made out of marble. Um, and it depicts the chariot race, race between Pelops and King Omnimaos. Omnimaos. And the story goes um, that King Omnimaos' daughter was Hippodamia, and it was a prophecy that if she ever married, the king would die. So her father always challenged her suitors to chariot race from Olympia to Corinth, and he would always win, and he would kill the suitor if he won um, so that they couldn't marry his daughter. And he always won because he had special horses from his father, the god Ares. So um, Pelops was a suitor that came along, and he ended up winning because he bribed the king's groom um, Myrtle, Myrtle Leos, um, to rig the royal chariot so that it would collapse during the race, and the king died because his chariot collapses. And then Pelops got his bride, but um, it does say that Pelops and his family suffered greatly because of his actions, and the tragedies of his family are suffered. Um, they suffered greatly, and it's featured in a lot of famous Greek literature from the classical era. era. So um, this is just a story from that time period of the chariot races between Pelops and Omnimaios. Um, and really the Eastern pediment, it shows all of the figures are kind of posed like actors on a stage. Um, Zeus is in the center, King Omnimaios and his wife are on one side and Pelops and Hippodamia are on the other side and they each have their chariots. So here's a couple chariots here, um, partially there anyway. And then the seer will take a look at that one. I believe he's sitting here, but um, you can see a close-up of him from the East Pediment, the Temple of Zeus. We're still talking about the Temple of Zeus. Um, we looked at the Temple of Hera earlier just to see what it looked like from the outside. But um, So he's kind of an interesting figure in that he depicts old age, which is extremely rare up to this point. He's balding, he has wrinkles, sagging musculature. He really has this shocked expression on his face, so he's showing a lot of real emotion unlike the archaic examples we looked at recently. Um, and then we'll take a look at the Centaur Maki West Pediment, the Temple of Zeus. So this is just the West Pediment now that we're looking at from the Temple of Zeus. And it's a really chaotic scene of Greeks battling centaurs. So we've got a mixture of calm figures and violent action. And um, you can see there's a centaur here, a centaur here. Um, I believe this is Zeus here at the middle and um, just a, a lot of chaos going on. But the Sanctar Maki is the same as Giganton Maki. It's, it's a symbolization of the Greek culture over um, chaos, basically, or other barbaric cultures that they considered barbaric anyway. Um, so early classical statuary abandons the rigid frontal Egyptian-inspired pose of the archaic sculptures that we looked at. The figures we looked at from the Temple of Zeus in Olympia show this change. So um, this is that same um, figure from the middle here. It's Zeus. Um, you can see he's pretty realistic. Um, his hair is still not totally amazing, but it's getting there. And then we can see here another example. Kratios boy from the Acropolis, Athens, Greece, 480 BCE. It's three feet, 10 inches high. And it's a very important statue in the history of art because it's the first time that an artist tries to show how a human actually stands. So up until this point, sculptors depict humans in a really stiff-legged pose. So think back to the Korai or even back to Egypt. Um, just in reality, humans actually shift their weight when they stand, and the torso is kind of flexible around the axis of the spine. And this sculpture shows this weight shift. He is 
you know, his right hip is dipping slightly um, to show a weight shift, and um, his right leg is bent in an ease, and then his other leg is straight and holding all of his weight, and his head turns slightly to the right um, and tilts a little bit, so he's no longer strictly frontal. And this weight shift in statuary really separates the classical from the archaic um, sculpt, like representation of of um, the human body, basically. Let's keep going. So this is a warrior from the Sea of Race, Italy. Um, it might be Race C, Italy. Uh, 460, 450 BCE. It's bronze, six feet, six inches high. And it's a, from a later date than the other piece we looked at. And it's taking this weight shift even farther. And this is a bronze statue found off the sea of the coast of Reci, Italy. And it's, it was on a ship in antiquity headed from Greece to Rome, where the Romans really admired Greek sculpture. And so, um, you know, this was being transported to Rome on a ship in antiquity, and it actually went down off the coast. So... Um, what we see is nearly intact. He used to have a helmet, sword, and a shield, but that's missing today. And it's done in bronze with a hollow casting technique, and it's hollow inside. And he features inlaid eyes, silver teeth, and eyelashes, copper lips, and nipples. And his head turns more dramatically to the side than Kratayos boy. And the arms are freed from the body as well. Um, natural motion is captured. And once again, um, it's very different from those frontal statues that we looked at from earlier periods. This is the wax, lost wax method of casting. I'm not going to take talk about that too long. Um, so we'll take a look at this piece. I'm not quite sure how much. Okay. Um, so this could be either Zeus or Poseidon, depending on what you know he actually yielded in this hand. It's missing. The weapon is. So if it was a trident, it would have been Poseidon. If it was a thunderbolt, it would have been Zeus. Um, but it was also found on an ancient shipwreck off the coast of Greece at Cape Artemision. And it's a bearded god. And as you can see, both arms are extended and his right heel is raised off the ground, which is really showing how somebody would actually, how their body would actually work if they were throwing something in this way. And it's a much more complicated pose than many of the examples that we've looked at. And it just shows a really an interest in reality and, and human anatomy, really. And then this is also a really important piece by, um, I believe, Myron, and it's called Discobolos, Discus Thrower, from the Esquiline Hill in Rome, Italy. And it's actually a Roman copy of a bronze statue. So we don't have the bronze statue anymore, but we do have this Roman copy. It's the best one that we have of this particular piece, the Discobolos, or the Discus Thrower. And um, so the Romans typically display these copies, these marble copies in their residences or public villas, and they're of lesser quality than the original bronzes, but you can still see at least, you know, what the Greeks were up to, and um, even though it's a copy. So, um, so the body of the discus thrower in motion, his chest is almost frontal, but it's twisted slightly. His arm, his right arm is like a pendulum on a, on a clock, basically kind of twisting behind him, and it's really reach the apex of its height and it's frozen in motion there and there are two interacting arches here so one formed by both of his arms and then i believe one formed by the head through the torso through the bent knee here so there's two arcs that are kind of interact interacting with each other and it makes a really dynamic piece and his face is emotionless much like archaic sculpture but he's not looking at us at least and he is focused on his task so um he is a little bit, obviously, more complicated than some of the um, archaic sculptures that we looked at. So we'll continue forward in the next video since I'm running out of time.